On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, which this week revolves around just one story, the upcoming Artemis 1 rocket launch to the moon. But don't worry, even though we're only talking about one event today, there is a lot to go over. So let's get going. This is the space race. It is finally happening. NASA has committed to a launch date of August 29th for the Artemis 1 moon mission with September 2nd and 5th as backup dates should weather or another small malfunction force a halt in the countdown. NASA techs have been working furiously to get the SLS rocket into launch readiness after the dubiously successful wet dress rehearsal on June 20th which discovered a problem with a hydrogen leak from an umbilical while fueling the rocket. The test did succeed its objectives though, so NASA moved the SLS back to the bay for repairs and decided to move ahead with planning for their first launch. And the techs seem to have done an amazing job getting the SLS ready to roll out to the pad last Tuesday, just slightly ahead of schedule. A lot has been said about the rocky development of the SLS already, so we're not going to be going over that again today. Instead, we're going to be talking about the mission itself and what it means for the future of cislunar operations. Artemis 1 is going to be completing a lot of firsts for spaceflight, not to mention the rest of the Artemis missions, and now that there's an actual date set, it's probably safe to get hyped. Also, just wanted to let you know about our Discord server. We've got over 1,500 members and host regular live watch parties within the community. We have some big events coming up for the first Starship launch, Artemis launch, and Tesla AI day. So if you aren't already, join our Discord server using the link in the description. So the Artemis 1 mission is planned to take about 42 days and will launch an uncrewed Orion capsule to the moon, launch some CubeSats along the way, and test a whole bunch of systems before heading back home for a splashdown. This is the biggest reason NASA has been gunning hard for the late August to early September date. If they can launch on the 29th, Orion will be home by October 10th. After that, the return date keeps creeping later and later, which is less than ideal. NASA is on a strict timetable for the Artemis program, and delays will be costly. More on that later. So, if everything goes as planned, Artemis 1 will lift off from Pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center on August 29th, sometime after 8.33 a.m. Eastern Time. Powered by four RS-25 engines, yes, the same ones that were the workhorse of the shuttle program, and two solid fuel boosters, the SLS will punch into orbit with over 8.8 .8 million pounds of maximum thrust. Once clear of the thickest part of the atmosphere, the SLS will jettison the empty boosters and the launch abort system. That's the little tower that sits on Orion's nose as a safety escape mechanism. A few seconds later, the main stage will cut off and the iconic orange tank will also be ditched, fated to fall back to Earth on its own. So long, and thanks for all the Delta V, big buddy. And Orion isn't sticking around either. After the main stage separates, the transfer stage will kick on and make a small burn to raise the vehicle's perigee and ensure it doesn't fall out of the sky. After a quick systems check, Orion will let out its beautiful solar panels and wait for the next big burn on the other side of the planet, which will send the capsule and service module on its way to the moon. And it's here that some last checks are going to be done, because after this next burn, there will be no turning back. The Translunar Injection, or TLI, burn uses what's left of the transfer stage's fuel to fling the vehicle in an arc towards the moon. It's here that the transfer stage will separate. The moon's gravity should send it off into deep space where it can't harm anything. It's also around this time that those CubeSats we mentioned, stored in the transfer stage, will be deployed in three batches, 
two on the way to the moon, and one while the transfer stage is in the lunar sphere of influence. In total, 10 CubeSats will maneuver into various orbits and begin a survey, looking for water and conducting some experiments to gather data on the effects of the mostly unprotected space in between Earth and the moon. Orion and its service module are on their own at this point and will make a couple of quick precision burns to adjust its trajectory before getting captured in a distant retrograde orbit, a very stable path that Artemis 1 will be testing for future missions. NASA plans for a couple of adjustment burns during this second half of the transfer to lunar orbit, but once there, the craft should be safe to move on to the biggest part of its mission. Orion is scheduled to remain in this orbit for about 6 to 19 days, or one and a half revolutions at max, while it tests various systems on board. Obviously, as this is an uncrewed mission, several systems will have to wait for testing by the Artemis II crew, but a bunch of the automated functionality, as well as the internal conditions of the craft, will get the once over by NASA ground techs. This part of the mission is mostly why it's planned to take as much as 42 days, since NASA can't be sure exactly how long testing will take, or what they might take advantage of on the flight. This is a data gathering mission, so they want to be as flexible as possible here. Once all that testing is over though, the Orion will make a burn to slingshot itself back to Earth, and maybe a couple more adjustment burns on the way to ensure a clean trajectory. Once close enough to the planet, Orion will separate from its service module, re-enter the atmosphere, and splash down in the Pacific, where it will be picked up by a waiting US Navy recovery ship. The whole structure of this mission makes it pretty clear that NASA is being typically cautious. The extra time allotment, the wide lunar transfer trajectory, and the long stay in lunar orbit are all designed to allow for the maximum amount of testing. Considering Artemis II will be a crewed mission, NASA rightfully wants to see all the problems during this mission when there's no chance of losing astronauts. But there are a few other things that make these missions different from any other we've flown. It's natural to compare the Artemis and Apollo missions, but those differences are so stark that it almost doesn't make sense to do that. The SLS is just a more efficient, more powerful, more sophisticated rocket. The Saturn V, the vehicle that powered the Apollo missions, was a brute by comparison. It was bigger, and while it produced over 1 million pounds less of maximum thrust than the SLS, it was able to put almost four times the amount of payload mass into low Earth orbit. But low Earth orbit isn't the game here. NASA estimated that Saturn V could move almost 50 tons to lunar orbit, but in practice, the lunar command module and the lunar module weighed just 24 tons in total. And that was using a more or less direct burn to the moon. We hadn't discovered the distant retrograde orbit yet, and Saturn V just didn't have enough power. So Apollo 11, for instance, ended up in an orbit only 118 miles above the lunar surface, orbiting a total of 30 times before heading home. Artemis 1, on the other hand, is designed to lift at least a 27-ton payload all the way to the moon, and Orion is precise and powerful enough to get into its DRO, which is considerably further from the lunar surface. Fluctuating from 216,816 miles to 271,739 miles. Not to mention that Apollo's lunar command module could only support three astronauts for 14 days. Orion and its service module has a crew capacity of two to six astronauts, can support them for about 21 days, and is powered by solar cells that can supply the vehicle almost constantly. So that's the main difference. The Apollo missions were groundbreaking, but we don't have to send our explorers into space in what must have felt like a closet anymore. Orion with its service module is basically a small hab, which is the clearest indication that Artemis is just a complete upgrade from Apollo 
top to bottom. Like we said, Artemis 1 represents a lot of firsts. It's the first crew-capable craft to try a distant retrograde orbit, the first crew-capable vehicle to make use of the Deep Space Network for communications. It'll fly further into space than any other human-rated craft before, etc. But it's what comes after that gets us really excited. If Artemis 1 is successful, Artemis 2 will launch, repeating Artemis 1's mission path but with a crewed capsule, which will be the first time humans have been to the moon in over 50 years. Artemis 2 will finish off the testing of the SLS and Orion by allowing for human testing of the equipment and systems that couldn't be tested during Artemis 1. Otherwise, it's pretty much going to be a repeat of Apollo 8's lunar flyby, except with HD cameras. So we're definitely looking forward to those images. As for what comes after that, the Artemis program has been proposed all the way to Artemis 10, but only Artemis 1 through 5 have been planned at this time. Artemis 3 will be carrying extra mission hardware and will hopefully be the first lunar landing in the program. Artemis 4 will be the first use of the improved SLS Block 1B launch system and the improved exploration upper stage. Honestly, we're going to have to do a video on the SLS and its system soon because the hardware is a story in its own right. Artemis 4 will also be delivering the IHAB module of the Lunar Gateway Station, the main habitat of that platform. This leads nicely into Artemis 5, which is going to deliver the Esprit module and refuel the Gateway, a multi-purpose hab that will add more fuel capacity and another airlock to the station. And while we absolutely enjoy the idea of seeing all this new tech going into space, what's really thrilling about this whole mission profile is the pace. Artemis 2 will launch in May 2024, 3 will lift off in 2025, 4 in 2026, and 5 in 2027, and so on. Every main Artemis mission is planned on a yearly launch cadence, but it all hinges on Artemis 1. There is a lot to be said about the SLS development program, but one thing that's undeniable is just how hard the folks at NASA have been working to see their rocket fly. The tech is solid and well-tested, the team is filled with some of the most experienced spaceflight techs in the world, and say what you want about the problems during testing, but even SpaceX's plans for cislunar operations rely very heavily on the stability of the Artemis program. NASA has a whole celebration plan for launch day, they are excited about this achievement, and it's very hard to blame them. Humans are going back to the moon after 50 years and the systems designed here will push us even further inside the next couple of decades. So, allow yourselves to get excited for this one too. I know we are, and August 29th can't come soon enough. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.